Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Marius. I will now uh, guide the question and answer session for these two talks. My first question is actually uh, from, uh, from the audience, and I think this sets up a very good uh, frame for opening and beginning the discussion. Uh, and I think uh, this is for uh, both of you, both uh, you, Rob, and you, Marius. Um, how do we, and this is from Amanda Courtright Lim, uh, and sh uh, she writes, how do we begin to address the infrastructure that was based on eugenic notions, such as in education, politics, medicine, and such, that, uh, that act, you know, or could act as the foundation of many of our current practices and beliefs and that serve clear public functions. And I think we can think about how museums function in this way. So would anyone like to start to answer the question to begin our discussion? Yeah, um, as I said in, in my talk, the, the American Museum of Natural History has long maintained a, a twin pronged approach to its existence, um, education and science. And this is why the Congress at the museum was so so important to, to the eugenicists. Um, without it, I think they they really didn't have the mechanisms to um, uh, popularize what, what they were doing. Although um, uh, eugenics was sort of mainstream at the point at that point in time, convincing the public was was something that they needed to do. And um, unfortunately, that's exactly the job of, of the museum is to educate the to educate the public um, with the science that we do. Um, and when you have a, an administration in, in the museum comprised of, of um, people like Henry Fairfield Osborne and um, uh, Winslet and, and others uh, at the American Museum at the time, um, they subverted the, the mission of the museum um, to their own, to their own um, needs and, and wants. And that's a, a really not so good thing. And they also, as I pointed out, the Board of Trustees didn't want to do anything to. So we have a situation where um, an institution completely failed, um, failed at its um, mission, really. Marius, do you have a further comment? Yeah. Um, firstly, I should say um, thank you, Rob, for uh, this wonderful presentation. Um, I've uh, greatly enjoyed that, and I think it's extremely useful to all of us to know a bit more about the intricacies of how the Congress came about and who played a role in how it was uh, presented to the public. Um, so um, that's one thing. Secondly, and in connection to the question, my point is that um, uh, particularly after the First World War, uh, and considering the dramatic human losses and the entire reshuffling of the world, eugenics goes into sort of, you know, uh, a, a full development. And uh, scientists try to attach some credibility to it, but then we have institutions. And the American Museum of Natural History is one example. Uh, and uh, it, it's interesting to see how this will develop for the next uh, 30 years because it happens all across the world. Yeah. It is before 1914, you had eugenic societies, but they're not associated to prestigious institutions, not only in America, but also in, in, in Europe or Britain. Uh, after the First World War, major institutions of research, universities will be associated with eugenics, giving it credibility. It's a completely different thing if you are uh, a rich individual and you write your own books and you publish them and you go to your gentleman club and you pro propagate ideas about uh, race and eugenics. And it's a completely different thing if a, a prestigious university, uh, a prestigious uh, department, a museum, or a public institution of any sort endorses that view and allows this uh, discussion to happen. And this is what occurred uh, already in 1912 when they met in London for the first big eugenic Congress. You have very important politicians who attended the Congress, giving it certain credibility. Winston Churchill was there. Uh, uh, Alexander Graham Bell was there. Uh, the second International Eugenic Congress was actually, uh, uh, you know, played a, a great deal in enhancing the relationship they had with uh, luminaries uh, such as Bell, for example, who was a scientific celebrity, of course. 
So uh, even those who are critical of eugenics later, uh, for example, Raymond Pearl, right? You mentioned Boas very aptly. I will just bring Raymond Pearl. In 1912, he's very uh, enthusiastic about eugenics, believing that there is a, the time is ripe to discuss eugenics. Of course, later on, he realized, as many others, uh, I suppose, that it was just uh, a completely different story. But all of these names, all of these institutions, all of these um, uh, political support, they, they did get played a significant role in, in making the transition from a pseudoscientific discussion to an acceptable discussion publicly, and then to a, a, a scientific uh, idea which could have legs and which circulated very quickly around the corners of the world. So um, the role of institutions um, and the role of museums in this particular conversation, I think, has to be highlighted as it was not just a place where discussions happened, but it was the medium through which discussions happened. Thank you, Marius. Uh, my follow-up question uh, for both of you, and it's a bit different for, for each, is um, how could you talk about, uh, each of you, how these, the, these discussions, these memorializations, these exhibits um, came about? Uh, and Rob, you can talk a little bit more about how American Museum of Natural History has, has done a number of things to start confronting many, uh, many historical legacies to begin, I suppose. And then I will pivot to Marius and he can talk a little bit more about the, well, yeah, about just how to these add, hmm. Just to add a little bit to what Marius said in the context of the American Museum, um, in 19, 1926, shortly after the Congress, uh, Osborne and Davenport I believe it was Davenport, started the American Eugenical Society, which was a major step um, in, in legitimizing the, the whole, whole uh, process. And the American Museum shortly after hired uh, a, a anthropologist named Harry Shapiro, who uh, was the president of the American Eugenical Society for a decade, I believe. And <clears throat> uh, Shapiro's um, uh, um, persona kind of overwhelmed the museum and its attitudes toward human diversity and human variability. Um, Shapiro was, was touted as a guy who could look at, a, look at newborns and um, determine what percentage of, uh, <laughs> of their background was German and Irish and so on. So um, his, his approaches were, um, I, I'm sorry to say, pretty unscientific. Um, it wasn't until the 1980s that uh, Shapiro retired and that we hired um, Ian Tattersall, who is probably the person who turned, um, turned the um, um, view of human evolution and human races and, and how we deal with human, human history around. Um, so that, that's a major, major point there is the hiring of somebody, the, the firing or the retirement of somebody um, who was promulgating the ideas and the hiring of someone who was, was um, fighting against those ideas. And, and since then, the museum has been very open um, about um, our involvement in eugenics. Um, I wish we were even more open than, than we have been in the past, um, but uh, we, we have um, opened our archives to several researchers. We have um, uh, talked about the eugenics co congresses in exhibits that we did in a 2001 exhibit that we did on the human genome. Um, and we opened a new hall, um, actually a replacement hall for the Hall of uh, Human Biology called the Hall of Human Origins, where we discuss race and, and um, uh, all of the uh, um, aspects of, of um, human, human evolution and human diversity. And um, we have, um, uh, I, I think, uh, taken on the, the centennial of this uh, horrible Congress uh, head on with some of the things that we've done. Um, some of the things that were presented in September, uh, I think were good examples of how an institution can, can face, face these things. Fantastic. Um, Marius, would you like to talk a little bit about um, in terms of the, uh, how you got the exhibit together and in particular, some of the go wider goals and purposes of, of 
the of the exhibit and your presentation. Yes, thank you. Um, in, it was connected to the uh, century of, you know, um, rethinking what it meant uh, um, and what it means still to us uh, when we look back to 1921. And um, organizing an exhibition uh, was a way of engaging with some of the themes uh, discussed at the Congress, but at the same time, putting it all into a more sort of long perspective. But there was another reason why I thought an exhibition is a good thing, because as Rob pointed out, uh, if we look at the history of eugenic movements everywhere, and this was highlighted yesterday as well by Alexander Minister, um, exhibitions were always part and parcel of the public engagement, if I can use this uh, new term, um, of the eugenicists. They realized immediately um, they are uh, very, on very shaky ground on the one hand. So how do you convince the public to buy into your arguments? So they went to fairs, they organized exhibitions. They go back to, you know, early 20th century uh, and major uh, world fairs um, and major public fairs were all accompanied by eugenic uh, exhibitions um, starting with already 1910s. We have 1915 in California, in San Francisco, the, the major uh, uh, international uh, affair. It's one example, and it continues. It's the same in the UK, in Britain. The eugenic society here made it part of its uh, program to spread education amongst the public. Now, this was done in, in many different ways uh, through incessant publications of various posters and, and artifacts and explanations for the general public. Uh, through public lectures that important geneticists, uh, biologists and scientists would give to the public or to the eugenic society. If you look at the British Eugenic Society, and if you look at the major uh, conferences organized by, by the society, um, which you wouldn't be able to uh, leave anyone out of the entire scientific elite of, of Great Britain during the 1920s and 30s. Okay. With few exceptions, all of them gave a public lecture to the eugenic society. And it was done in a very uh, casual way, uh, addressing important issues, but in a very casual way, so to attract. Of course, uh, this is one side of the story. Um, we have another side of the story when people, uh, eugenicists who are more concerned with the scientific credibility of eugenics, were rather um, reluctant to do this form of public engagement. And I'll give you one example. Um, and uh, we have some in America as well. Uh, uh, Rob mentioned Morgan and Mueller and others who were always, you know, at least at the beginning, ambiguous towards eugenics. They were more radical later. Carl Payson, who was an outspoken eugenicist, Carl Payson, famous statistician, as, as you know, and disciple of, Carl, uh, of uh, Francis Galton and, and protege and biographer of Francis Galton. However, he was extremely critical of the eugenic society. It accused the eugenic society of um, not having scientific standards, of popularizing, of being a fad, exactly what Rob was saying, you know, being a, 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 a fad. And he was very upset with how the eugenic society believed that without proper scientific checking of some of the eugenic ideas, they could go out and claim they could fix this and they could fix that. So uh, Carl Pearson was, you know, we need to firstly establish very strong mathematical and biological foundations for eugenics and then move into popularizing it. So he didn't like that at all. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the importance of, of uh, memorializing and uh, uh, explaining this today, it's even more, I suppose, important because uh, there is a huge literature of course, uh, on various aspects of eugenics and everywhere you have uh, case studies uh, wonderfully analyzed and, uh, uh, and problematized. But the public, of course, um, knows uh, little about it. Uh, and then exposing in a way and engaging uh, the general public with the history of a particular institution and the role it played uh, in disseminating eugenics is crucially important. In, in the UK and particularly in London, we had this with the University College, 
of course, uh, there's a big public debate about the role played by University College London and the entire discussion about naming and renaming various um, uh, lecture theatres um, because they carried the name of Francis Galton or Carl Payson. Uh, and the debate about Fisher in Cambridge uh, was important. So, and I could see that happening, of course, uh, at various levels. Um, and um, bringing the institution in, bringing these exhibitions in, because as Rob pointed out so poignantly, ultimately, uh, when you realize the, 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 the extraordinary effort these people put into the exhibition, it cost a lot of money for, at the time. Uh, it was done uh, quite uh, exquisitely, if you look at the catalogs. Also, if you look at the people who got involved, if you look, for example, at the names who contributed with exhibits to the international exhibition organized in 1921, you'll be surprised to find so many of the very important uh, medical uh, authorities in America in the 1920s, mm -hmm. women and men. They contribute with, with samples from their collections from the hospitals. Mm -hmm. So apart from the racists like Madison Grant, apart from people like Davenport, you have a host of other people who are actually very well established and are considered to date uh, revered by the medical uh, tradition, for example, or by the scientific mm -hmm. community. It was the same with the British delegation. British delegation uh, created their own exhibition there. And of course you have people like uh, Darwin and, and others. But, uh, and I'll finish with this, uh, Chris. Um, let's not forget the others who are there. And um, also uh, people from all over the world. Uh, this is the first time that uh, they could claim, and this was Osborne's idea, uh, if we look at the opening address uh, Osborne gave to the Congress on that um, very uh, hot uh, uh, the day in September, it was, I think, the, the eighth uh, hottest day. Now it's, uh, sorry, it was the, the, the fourth hottest day on record. Now it's the, the eighth, but at the time. So everybody flocked to the museum because, you know, uh, it was, it was cool and it was uh, nice to be inside and stay away from the heat. And Osborne gives this amazing opening address when he say, says simply, this is our moment. We need to capitalize on this extraordinary historical moment. And we're finally emerging from the vortex of barbarism, which is the First World War, and we create something amazing. And he, uh, he, spoke, to the, he spoke to the public when he said that. He, his target was the public as much as it was the scientists or the participants of the Congress. No, thank you, Marius. That was really fascinating discussion, and I think absolutely correct. Um, one of the questions that I want to take from the, from the Q&A is Marcy Darnowski's question, or her two questions, actually, which she very uh, conveniently summarized as, what do we gain and what do we lose by talking about eugenics as pseudoscience? And... I, I think, Rob, because your, yeah. your presentation directly addresses this question, this is a question for you first, and then, Marius, of course, you can add uh, a, a comment. Yeah, it, um, I think it's, it's um, uh, very important to, to um, uh, point out the pseudoscience in, in eugenics, obviously. Um, you know, Pearson uh, was, was a good at it. Um, Bateson, who was invited to the meeting, declined to go. I, I read his his the words of his declination, and it's kind of funny. He, he, he kind of it, it's a it's a back it's, it's a backhanded sl a, a compliment. You know, you guys can do what you want, but it's not scientific, so I'm not going to go. Um, and I, I focus on what what Boas said about it. Bo Boas um, knew that that. Um, the eugenics was trying to understand human behavior and trying to do something about human behavior. And of course, that was his, his expertise. And Boaz knew that human behavior was so complex um, that, that he, he had no hope for, for um, uh, there being a scientific explanation for any human behavior, really. And, and he's re really clear about this in his 1916 um, eugenics review review paper, um, and it, it brings me brings to mind something that the late Richard Lewontin, uh, who passed away this last year, said about um, the genetic basis of human behaviors, and and the, the uh, genetic basis of of 
topics that, that come up in eugenics. And he, he has a two word response to it, which is tough luck. We're never going to figure it out. We might as well, we, we should just step back and realize that we're not going to figure these things out. I think that's equally important for us to realize. And it's come up a, a few times in the, in the previous days about how do we go out and, and collect more data on skin color and, and hair texture and things like that. We're, we're trying, I think what we're doing is we're oversimplifying what we do as scientists. And we're taking the easy way out by, by collecting data on these things that, that the eugenicists collected data on. And we see how much progress they made. Um, none, no scientific progress uh, what, what, whatsoever. So I, I think we, we need to keep that in mind. Um, and we, we not only need, do we need to assess the scientific worth of eugenics, but we need to continually assess the scientific worth of what we do what we do currently as scientists and what we do as, as researchers. So, um, and, and, you know, I, 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 I'm uh, guilty of a lot of, a lot of, um, of this oversimplifying myself, but in, in essence, you need to step back and look at it really hard so that it doesn't, um, you know, end up being unscientific and, and end up, being in that same category with eugenics. I mean, I, just to um, jump in quickly, I think this is also a different question that we can consider, but not necessarily answer in the context of this discussion is, what do we do with the, the legacies and the understanding of, of geneticists like Fisher and Dobzhansky, whose work is foundational, but who clearly held racist colonialist beliefs and and who advocated uh, immoral, uh, unethical practices. Um, do you have uh, sort of some insights about how scientists and also the general public should should um, think about these figures? Um, so going forward as, as their views and opinions become more well-known, I think Dobzhansky is, is a little less known than Fisher's, but still uh, as stark. And Marius, I'll let you uh, respond as well. Um, thank you. The caveat here is that at the time, of course, um, many of these people were, you know, the top uh, scientists, not just in biology, but in, in medicine or soci sociology or demography. So it's, it's extremely difficult to call that uh, pseudoscientific uh, because at the time they looked at it as the cutting edge of science. They also looked at it as a synthesis of various disciplines. That's, that's another thing that people tend to gloss over but not understand quite uh, uh, properly because it wasn't just one discipline. Eugenics was meant to be a, a, a synergetic way of looking at various problems. Uh, so it was not just I, I, with I, one discipline. Uh, so that's, that's, that has to be said uh, because I think it is important. Uh, uh, and I agree with with comments made uh, here that um, by simply call it pseudo science, we basically are brushing aside the way they looked at it and the, the way they believed they could contribute to various uh, debates on, on human heredity, human progress and social problems of all sorts. Um, so that's, that's a complicated thing, but of course it is, it is, a, it is a, 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 a hermeneutical conversation and it's geographic debate in many ways. Uh, this is not what the public um, uh, per perceives. And uh, already in the 1960s, philosophers such as uh, uh, who criticized the Nazi regime used the argument that eugenics is a pseudoscience to really read the entire experience of eugenics through the prism of Nazi uh, 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 racial hygiene program. Uh, and it was much easier to call eugenics uh, irrational, uh, George Lucas, the famous Marxist philosopher, uh, described eugenics in this way. So there was a, the, the drive to, to look at it. And of course, at the time, people didn't really discuss what happened the American eugenics or British eugenics or Scandinavian eugenics, let alone other places around the world. No one knew anything about what happened in, in Central America or Eastern Europe. Uh, this is very recent. So the whole discussion about eugenics as a pseudoscience goes back to the 1960s. This is how it was formulated. It was a very easy way to actually 
uh, uh, get uh, get us uh, forward by not examining our past because it was was relegated to the Nazi experience. So they were they politicized it. It was abuse of science the Nazi doctors did, and uh, that developed in that direction. It's only recently, for the past uh, three decades, that we see a completely new way of understanding the foundations of of eugenics, uh, and then we have new scholarship that's able to looks at it in a way that allows for these idiosyncratic readings of eugenics to emerge. Um, so sh we shouldn't completely uh, fall into the trap of, of, uh, of uh, you know, um, diminishing entirely the views of these people, the way they perceive themselves scientifically. However, I would argue that it is very important to keep that uh, element in perspective. And if we want to, to talk about anti-eugenics, then certainly the scientific element of it is, is, is center to our arguments. We criticize it because of its alleged scientific pretensions uh, and where it failed uh, because of its human loss and human tragedies. Right? So um, we cannot go around it, uh, uh, but we need to address it in a way which is uh, attentive to historical nuances and is attentive two languages being used at the time, and then how those languages develop throughout uh, 20th century to this day. Rob, uh, if you have any further comments? Well, I, I, I think that I, I've really enjoyed hearing Marius's comments. I, I'm uh, in awe. <laughs> but I, I think that the, the, um, if you go back and you read the texts of the, of the talks, from the 2021 conference, or if you look at the summaries of the exhibits um, from, from uh, um, those catalogs that I showed, um, you, you get a sense for really bad science. So, so the, the, the um, important uh, researchers like Morgan and um, uh, some of the other well-respected geneticists didn't contribute papers to, that, to, the, to the collection. And but the rest of the papers are are drivel. I mean, if you if you look at them, and so I think I, I don't know if this is helpful, Marius, but I think there were if, if you if you look at the science or the purported science that was being done, it just wasn't there. And so somebody it, it was easy pickings for somebody like Bateson or Pearson or Boas to look at it and go, oh, that's that's drivel. You know, that's that's over interpreting. That's that's using um, your your God-given brain to do something silly. So, um, and, and but you're right. It it, it it took a while for for the the uh, questioning to begin. And you know the uh, Amer American Eugenics Society didn't disband until the 1990s, right? I think it was the 1990s that it disbanded. And and it's not like eugenics is over either. I mean, we so, still see it all over the place. So. Um, just, I'm, I'm just trying to point out that the science in, in eugenics, the science in understanding human behaviors, to me, hasn't gotten any better over a century. Um, and, and I think it's, it goes back to Dick Lewinton, tough luck. We're, we're, we're just in a tough luck position. And, and um, we, need to ask, we, don't, we need to ask different questions. Asking that question is not the right question. Asking a, a, a different question, um, collecting the data that we need to collect that's much more informative and much more useful in science rather than skin color and hair texture, be, we need to be more industrious about how we collect phenotypes for human variation and how we, we use that to, to say something important and interesting about our species. Because all this stuff about skin color, hair texture, all this stuff is, to me, just so, so uninteresting. <laughs> so, Rob, actually, to follow up on what you just said, um, which is, a, I think, a really important point, um, how, uh, and I, I think in a related sense, how, so the American Museum of Natural History, just like the NIH, is, is a source of trusted scientific information and trusted research programs and trusted funding yeah. in advancing revolutionary science. How do scientific institutions confront eugenic legacies while also 
remaining uh, remaining forthright about the the potentialities of these newly emerging sciences. Obviously, they're connected, and I want to I want to well, have you well, il- illustrate and emphasize that. We've just gone through four years of of extreme anti science attitudes, um, and um, it's really hurt us. And it, it, it's the kind of um, that that kind of anti scientific thinking is is um, uh, not only bad for understanding historical phenomena like eugenics, but for understanding some very prominent modern problems that we have um, and, and this lack of of scientific um, approach, this lack of being able to explain things in scientific terms. Um, or this need on the part of a museum and on part of the NIH to explain things in scientific terms is really important. Um, we're, we're um, I, I mean, I, I don't want to sound too alarmist, but we, we, we could have things like eugenics hanging around with us for a decade or two. And we don't want that. We want to get beyond anything that's pseudoscientific or, or um, anti-scientific as quickly as we can and move and move on. And, and we need to use eugenics as an example, I, I think, in, in, in many ways. The museum, um, you're right, the museum and NIH has, has just an amazing website with information on it. And just, just it's a it's a go to thing. The museum is the go to place for for um, science in, in the, the city of New York. I mean, it's it, so we have an obligation to, to um, make sure that our science is clear and that people understand that our science is important, whether it be dinosaurs or the colors of butterflies, or as we've just uh, completed at the American Museum, a whole um, web, website on COVID, um, on uh, SARS-CoV-2. So um, we're trusted. And, you know, Marius's exhibit is trusted. Right, we, we, museums and and exhibits and NIH and NSF and all these places are trusted, and we 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 need to really um, uh, take advantage of that trust and and be true to that trust. And sometimes it's it, it fails as 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 it did for eugenics in, in the uh, early 1900s in the American Museum. So I, I just wanted to jump in and say we have two more, only two more minutes, and I think we should try to end by focusing on what Rob has said about this, about the meaning of eugenics obviously being about confronting, understanding the history, uh, uh, confronting present day eugenics, but also building trust. And I think uh, to, to talk about science, to talk about uh, problematic legacies, problematic individuals, so Marius, could you talk a little bit more about sort of uh, thinking about the history of eugenics and present day uh, manifestations and science generally as, as part of this trust dynamic, if I'm, if I'm clear enough? Well, how do we build trust to understand trust? In, how do we build trust in science through understanding eugenics and its histories? Well, this is probably, you sh- we should have uh, uh, organized a conference only on this question. <laughs> It's extremely difficult to offer an answer in a minute, uh, but um, I, I completely agree with Robin, uh, with you that uh, gaining trust is uh, it's essential in this conversation, and uh, also full transparency. Uh, we mentioned some of the names here, and we need to come clear with and clean with some of the names. Uh, we mentioned Muller. We could mention Julian Huxley. We could mention a lot of you mentioned uh, um, uh, uh, Robert well, Cook. Yeah, yeah, and all of these names. Yeah. Who, uh, rarely appear, but they should appear. So, in other words, full transparency. Also, I should uh, uh, like to add that um, if we if we do go the nine yards into exploring the legacies of eugenics, then we have to look outside uh, genetics, um, and we need to look at other disciplines. Uh, demography very important. Uh, public health extremely important. Uh, and then we can and to mention just. To anthropology, because if it's anthropology, absolutely right. without and uh, psychiatry, I mean, the development of psychiatry and psychology cannot be dissociated from the development of eugenics. And then we can bring together these questions that uh, were highlighted by, by Rob in his presentation and in his comments. Then, how do we 
in trust and institution to represent that uh, reckoning with the past. Because ultimately, we need the institutions to do their work as much as individuals do their work. So, uh, Rob, any concluding thoughts? Because we are we are a little over. No, I, I thought that was perfect. All right. Thank you both. Uh, that was a fascinating uh, question and answer session and, and absolutely fantastic presentations. I want to um, underscore to the audience that we will now be going on break until 2.45 uh, in the afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. We will see you then. Thank you again. <laughs>